Hello. Hi, my name is Alex Jersa, and I am our family life pastor here. I want to welcome you here in the room, uh, the high schoolers. I want to welcome you. Hi, Galaxy Worship Center, the, uh, the junior hires, and if you're watching online, hello to you as well. Today we are in part three of our series called Squad Goals. It's also the finale. We're bringing it to a conclusion uh, of this awesome series that we've been going through over the last couple of weeks. In the heart of Squad Goals is we are talking about the truth that we are not meant to live this life by ourselves. So we are meant to live it alongside other people in community. We learned that lesson in 2020, and we are continuing to learn it today. But God's word already had stuff said about how we are supposed to live. So we're going to dive right in. We're going to look at what King Solomon said, one of the wisest people to ever live. God gifted him with the, the wisdom, probably the wisest person besides Jesus to ever live. And it says this in Ecclesiastes 4, 7 through 12. I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone, without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is also meaningless and depressing. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But if someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Week one of the series, we saw that as Matt Bartlett talked about how there's these group of friends, and this group of friends came together, and they heard that Jesus was nearby, and they also had a friend that was paralyzed, and they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get our friend, and we're going to bring him directly to Jesus. So they go there, and they have to take off these tiles on a roof to lower their friend down, but when they do that, when they together went This guy got healed and his sins were forgiven. They got to participate in a miracle led by Jesus. Last week, Alvin was here and he was talking about this guy named Gideon. Gideon with 300 men. If you heard the message last week, then you know it started with a lot more, but then it was whittled down to 300. But God used this group of people to take down this ginormous army, all because of the power of God. They got to witness a miracle of God by going in it together. And what I want to tell you today is that God is the same as he was in the Bible. That is the same God that we worship today. And that God wants to do miracles through you as well. And we're talking about in squad goals because it's pretty clear to God's word. We saw it in Ecclesiastes. We saw it in the stories that we've already talked about, the real life stories. But God wants to do miracles with us, through us. And he's called us to live in community while we do that. So here is the take-home point. So one point that this whole message is all about. It's simply, Jesus wants to do miracles through you. We are literally called the body of Jesus. That he is the head, we are the body. And as our head can like tell our hand to go and pick something up, Jesus wants to use us in the same way to do his work on this planet. Now, sometimes what we want as people, we want to go around and see the burning bush talking to us, but God doesn't always work in those ways, but he still works in miracles right now. And you might be saying, well, I'm too young, like not me, not maybe later, maybe later in life, but no, God's saying he wants and can use you right now. For me, just to share a little bit about my story, when I turned 16 years old, I was a part of a worship team. And as a part of the worship team, I played bass guitar. And it, at the time, felt like a small thing. But looking back, I got to participate in people walking into the throne room of God, not because of me, but because of God using me. After I played bass guitar, I learned how to play drums and eventually guitar. Then I met my wife who, if you were here last week, she was singing on the stage. She has a wonderful voice and she taught me how to sing. I was able to to start to learn how to worship God uh, vocally and in leading in those ways, which has been an amazing blessing. And it's been cool being able to partner with God in those ways. But one of the coolest times of my life worshiping God was when I was in Vietnam. I was in Vietnam a few years ago at Southeast Asia Prayer Centers, friends around the table where they gather a bunch of missionaries from all over and they come and celebrate what God has been doing. 
Our very own Sam Walk uh, is part of Southeast Asia Prayer Center. Can we give a round of applause? Sam Walk? Sure, she's in here somewhere. Sam Walk? Sam Walk, good job, Sam Walk. Working for an awesome organization. So I went there and I was, I was able to hear from these incredible speakers about how God is doing these miracles all over the place. I got to hear this, this man and he was telling these prophecies about stuff that was going to happen, about people in the room that were sick from certain things and they came up and they got healed. And one of the coolest things that happened was I was listening to worship one day and I felt God speak to my heart and saying, you're going to be on that stage. And now I wasn't desiring to be on the stage. I thought, maybe, yeah, it may be cool someday. But I was like, I'm not going to be on the stage. That band's way better than me. I'm not that gifted. Like, they don't even know me. I'm not going to be asked to be on that stage. I felt God saying, sit down and write down two worship songs. So I said, okay. So I sat down and I wrote out two songs I knew. The first one was Sanctuary. It's a song that my, my wife taught me whenever she was teaching me how to sing. And then the other one was Great Are You, Lord, both songs that I knew the chords to, the words to, so I wrote them down. And I just kind of kept them in my, my journal. The very next morning, nothing had happened. I wasn't like, hey, you, sir, right there, you look like you can sing. Here's a guitar. Come on on stage. That didn't happen. Um, it been, that would have been like, whoa, what's going on? Um, but instead, I went to sleep. I woke up. And the next day, I went to breakfast, was eating, I don't know, bacon or something. Um, anyone like bacon more than sausage in the Galaxy Worship Center? Yeah, bacon more than sausage? Yeah, a good bacon's good. I like sausage more. But I, I think both are, are pretty good. Um, so I was eating probably bacon and sausage, because why not just have both, and pancakes. And I was sitting next to this guy named Jeff. He is a pastor in Singapore. He was also the guy that was talking about prophecies earlier in our trip. He was saying about how, hey, I, there's someone in here with a leg injury. I don't know who it is, but come on forward. We want to see you healed today. And it was incredible. I ended up being sitting next to him, which was cool because he was also the worship leader for the week. And Jeff met me. He said, hey, what's your name? I said, Alex. And he said, hey, I'm leaving today. And so I can't keep leading worship could you please lead worship for me? And I was blown away. I had not met this guy. This guy did not know me. He didn't know that I could do any kind of, of worship ability. I wasn't going around talking about it. I wasn't like, hey, go tell Jeff that I can play guitar. Like there wasn't any seeds planted by me. I went to sleep. I woke up and this guy asked me to do that. God was doing something miraculous. That night, so I taught the band, and it was cool because there's people from different languages that were up there, so we got to, to learn this song together, and then we got to, to lead it with these missionaries. Again, nothing about me. It was all completely God just working in this moment. It was one of these really cool instances where the worship just kept going because people came up and they were praying and praying and praying. So the guy that was running was like, just keep going. Unfortunately, I knew two songs. So I um, just kept doing those two songs. Um, eventually, everyone probably hated those two songs. But we kept doing them over and over and over because, again, I didn't have anything written. I'm not that good at memorizing songs. So we were just playing, playing, playing. Eventually, they gave me the okay to stop. My fingers wanted to bleed. And so I got off the stage and I went to the guy, Mark Eppert, who started Southeast Asia Prayer Center. And he looked at me and he said, why did you pick that song? And they said, who put you up to singing that song? And I was like, what? Like, am I getting in trouble? Like, I was just, I just knew. So, so I said, I don't know. Like, God prompted me yesterday before I got asked to do it. I really feel like it was a miraculous thing. And my, my wife taught me this song. Uh, which song do you mean? And he said, Sanctuary. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that song my wife taught me. I know it's like 25 years old. So I didn't know if he was, like, criticizing me because it was a super old song. But he was like, that was the song that I was listening to the day I trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Like, he told me literally during that song, I gave my life over to Jesus. He said that was a blessing to me and it spoke to my heart. And I, again, was just blown away because it was a moment where I got to see God tangibly move on this planet where I was just ready and willing and nothing special about me. And God decided to use that instance to show me about how he is working right now. And it's frustrating for me in some ways to look back and say, were there other times in my life that God wanted to do a miracle through me, but I wasn't willing, that I didn't want to sit down and write something because it seemed foolish, or if someone asked me to do something, I said, I don't know if I can. Or maybe there was a time in my life, and maybe you, you can relate with this. Maybe there's a time in, in my life where God has prompted me, go pray for that person. I go, I don't know, that would be kind of weird. If they come up and ask me about prayer, I'll do it. Or a time where it says, just go talk to that person and be nice. I feel there's a prompting and I don't do it. So the question I have to ask myself and I wanted to ask you today as well is, have you stopped yourself from participating in God's miracles? 
I know that might sound like a heavy question, but has there been a time, think about it in your own heart, in your head, has there been a time because you were unwilling to listen to what God has prompted you to do that you haven't seen a miracle because we weren't ready and willing to be used by God? There's this guy named Rick Warren, and he started this church called Saddleback, and he recently just retired, and the church grew to like 35,000 people, 15 different branches, and he's one of the best-selling authors of the last like century. He wrote Purpose Driven Life, if you've ever heard of it. Uh, he, all of this was, I mean, attributed to God. God did amazing things through Rick's life. He's still living. He's just retired now. But one time he was at this big conference, and it was in the UK, and there he was talking about how he's been able to see miracles. And he simply said this, the only reason God uses him is that he expects God to use him. That's it. He said, the only reason God uses Rick Warren is because he's constantly expecting God to do things in and through his life. So then the question goes, are we expecting God to use us? God wants to use us in big ways. He wants to do miracles through you and me literally right now. If we've given our lives over to Jesus God's word tells us the Holy Spirit dwells and lives in us. Greg talked about that a couple weeks ago. And because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, if we've given our lives to Jesus, the resurrection power of Jesus dwells in us. And God wants to see his miracles break forth on this planet so that people can see him, so people can be healed, so people can be drawn to Jesus. Because that's ultimately the purpose, the only purpose really of miracles, that people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And God wants to use us for those purposes, for those reasons. And it's cool because as we look at Jesus in his life, we see that he gathered a group of people together. And they weren't special people. They were average people. They were normal people. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were the people that others outcast from the, the training to be rabbis. None of them made the cut to be a teacher of religious law or anything like that. They were just normal people. And Jesus gathered them together. He called them his disciples. And there's 12 of them. And Jesus grew them up, helped them to learn, and they did miracles through them. And we're going to read one of those instances. We're going to actually read it from two different authors. We're going to first read it through John, um, who was one of Jesus' disciples. So this is him seeing it, writing it down. We're also going to write it, read it through the eyes of a guy named Luke. Luke was a doctor, and what he did was he went around and he basically interviewed a bunch of people. He wanted to get all his documents together to show a friend of his, and ultimately to show all of us, that Jesus is real, that he really did walk this earth and he did what he said he does. Now, there's, two, there's different details in both accounts, and I always find that comforting. Some people might point out that there's different uh, details in the accounts of Jesus, because in God's word, just so you know, has Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four are accounts of Jesus, and they have some differences, but they never contradict each other. They're simply just differences of point of view. So for instance, if me and Justin were at the same thing, um, the same event, and you asked us about it, we'd share different points of views. We'd share different details because we're different people. We saw different things. And so they never contradict each other, but they actually complement and help us see the full picture when we read them together. So we're going to read John 6, 1 through 13, and then we're going to look at Luke 9, 12 through 17, both the same encounter and the same story. It says this, after this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, so these are his disciples, Philip, Andrew, um, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. So if you think they all had a wife, 10,000. If they all had a wife and a kid, 15,000. You can go on from there to extrapolate how many people might have been there. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave them to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 20 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. 
So John tells us a story, and now we're going to look at Luke and his encounter. And there's a little detail about how Jesus handled the bread and the fish, and, and I thought it was really interesting, so I wanted to share it with you as well. Late in the afternoon, the 12 disciples came to him and said, send the crowds away to the nearby village and farm so they can find food and lodging for the night. There is nothing to eat here in this remote place. But Jesus said, you feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Or are you expecting us to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd? For there were about 5,000 men there. Jesus replied, tell them to sit down in groups above about 50 each. So the people all sat down. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven, and blessed them. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. I really like what we learn about Jesus in that moment. Because when there was a need, two things stand out. The first thing is when he took the boy's food, what does he do? He takes it, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he uses it. He takes it, he blesses it, he breaks it, and then he uses it. And I think it's so interesting because he does the same thing in our lives as well. He did it to the disciples. The disciples came to him. They gave them, they gave Jesus their lives. They said, okay, we're going to leave our jobs and our families. We're going to follow you with everything. He took their lives. He blessed them. He broke them. He trained them up. He rebuked them at some points. He helped teach them what they needed to know. And then he used them for his kingdom. He used them in this way. And God wants to do the same thing for us. He wants us to give him our lives. He wants to take our lives, bless them, break them, and use them. To take them, to bless them, to break them, to use them for his miracles. Second thing that I think is astounding from this is that Jesus could have went around and he could have fed everyone by himself. He could even have the food come from heaven. He could have been like Big Macs for everyone, and it would have happened because of who Jesus is. But instead, what does he say? He went to the disciples and said, you feed them. He wanted the disciples to partner with him in this ministry. He wanted the disciples to be able to go around and be able to witness and experience this miracle that Jesus was doing in that moment. So the disciples got to be the ones to give the food away. And what do we learn from that? That God wants to do that with us too. He wants to take our lives, to bless them, to break them. And when he does that, it's hard. Honestly, that breaking part isn't easy. When we give over our lives, it's not easy. It's giving over control. But when that happens, we get blessed and we get used for his kingdom and his glory. And when that happens, we get to experience life as it was meant to be lived. Because he doesn't break our, our good stuff. He breaks the bad habits and then he fills us in with the purpose that he's designed for us so that you and I can partner with what God wants us to do on this planet. Then he uses us for his miracles and his glory. You see, Jesus wants to empower us to do mighty works for his kingdom. Jesus wanted to do ministry with and alongside his disciples, and he wants to do it with you today. God wants to use you and me for him. So we got to ask this question next. How can I serve God's kingdom. What can we do? Now, again, we talked about the beginning. You might be thinking, I can't do anything now. I'll do it later. But that's just not true. God can use you in small ways and in big ways currently. Let's think of some practical ways. You could go to school tomorrow. You could say, God, just point me in the direction you want me to. And then again, like Rick Warren said, expect him to work. Expect him to show up. So God, how do you want to use me today? And then when you're in school, if you see someone sitting alone, you might feel a little movement in your heart to go, hey, go sit with that person. You might be in line buying a coffee and you might feel something in your stomach going or your heart, your soul, spirit moving around and saying, pay for that person behind you. They're having a hard day. Or maybe you're just watching and you're listening. And as you do that, God's speaking to you about what is going on. You're holding a door for someone that needs it. God can use you in those ways God can also use you to serve, literally, right now. We look at New Life students, and we have students all around helping, serving in different capacities. We just led worship with Ada and Sophia and Hudson, all high schoolers. I know that for a long time, maybe last three years, Ava's been serving at the the snack shack. I know that even on weekends, Seth Reedy, while he was a high, high schooler, he would serve in the parking lot, welcoming people. On the weekends, there's no reason you couldn't do that. There's no reason you couldn't welcome people or make coffee on a weekend. I know we have Bella who serves in the New Life Kids. I know that there's 
plenty of opportunities, possibilities for you to serve God's kingdom right here. I know there's students that go on the mission every single year that serve at things like Fishbone and Butler where they serve kids meals and just show them the love of Jesus. There are practical ways that you can get involved. And what does God say? That we shouldn't just get involved by ourselves. We should do that together. Again, this is in squad goals. This is what we're talking about because the disciples did this as a group. And when Jesus sent out his disciples, he didn't send them out by himself because there was times where he would go and say, hey, you guys go to this village, you guys go to this village, but he'd always send them in groups of two. So for us, what do we learn from that? Ecclesiastes say we're better together. So let's serve together. Find a friend and say, hey, do you want to help at the snack shack? Do you want to serve on the worship team? Do you want to go on the weekend and say hi to cars as they come in? Do you want to go to Fishbone with me? Do you want to go to the mission over the summer? Do you want to go pray for people in our school and serve in different ways? Because you have the ability to do that. Because God has created you good, and he's given you good gifts. And if we trust in Jesus, Lord, and Savior, the Holy Spirit is in us, and God wants to use us to bring about his miracles. And all we got to do is be willing and be ready. And God will speak to us, through us, and use us. What do we got to do? We got to give our lives over. He's going to bless them, break them, and then he'll use us for his kingdom and glory. And we could do that through this next step. It says, I will give my life to Jesus and allow him to use it however he wants. However he wants. That's a really big part of it. Because giving our lives over is saying, all right, control is yours. But let me tell you, when we do that, oh man, we get to experience so many amazing things. Because God wants us to experience his glory, his goodness, his Holy Spirit, his miracles, his life-changing ability. And we get to do that when we give over our lives to him. If you've never done that before, I want to share with you how we can do that. Because, again, if it starts with giving our lives over to Jesus, we have to find a way to do that. And thankfully, at New Life, we say it all the time. We say it's as simple as ABC, to give over our lives. We start by we admit. We say, all right, I'm a sinner. I screw up. I mess up. And I need Jesus to forgive me of my sins and death. And then B, we believe. We believe in Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, which means our God, our master, our owner, and our rescuer. And then we confess. We confess our sins, ask for that forgiveness, and then we commit to following him. Again, not alone. Greg talked about that with the Holy Spirit. Again, if you missed that, go back and watch that in our Alpha series. The Holy Spirit dwells in us when we give our lives over, and that is who, he is who, helps us out in these situations. So what we're going to do is we're going to give this opportunity right now to pray. And I'm going to say a prayer, and if you've never trusted in Jesus, you've never given your life over I'm going to give an invitation to do that. And then after that, I'm going to give a second invitation because maybe you've given your life over before, but maybe you've tried to take it back. You said, well, okay, God, you can have my life, but I kind of want to keep this part of it. I want to keep my sports team. I want to keep my, my girlfriend and myself. I don't really want you to be a part of that relationship or you to be a part of that activity. We're going to do a prayer for anyone that is in that situation that wants to say, all right, God, I'm all in. I want to give everything to you. I want to experience what you want me to experience on this earth. And the amazing thing is, as we do that and we expect him to work, we'll see him work. So let's pray, and we'll do both of those prayers now. Dear God, right now, I pray for anyone that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that they've never given their lives over to you. I pray that you will speak to their hearts right now, and I pray that they'll say this prayer alongside me. They'll say, Dear God, I believe you are the one true God, and that your son Jesus came and died and rose again for me. I admit I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Bring me into your family today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Jesus, be my Lord and my Savior. Pray this in Jesus' name. And dear God, I pray for anyone in here that maybe is holding something back from you, whether it's a relationship, a hobby, the future, whatever it is, God, I pray that right now they'll say this prayer alongside me as well. They'll say, dear God, I give you everything. And I mean everything. Take my life, bless it, break it, and use it for your kingdom. Speak to us, God, and show us how you want to partner with us on this planet. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like to live this next step out with me, we're going to put it on the screen. I'd ask you to read it. Again, whether you're in here or you're in the Galaxy Worship Center, 
Let's read it together. I will give my life to Jesus and allow him to use it however he wants. Amen.